Hello, this is Pastor Kirk Massey Jr. with Native Christians Network. I serve on the Northern Reservation in, uh, in Apache, Apache land, White Mountain Apache tribe, and I serve the Church of the Oakland Bible and Shepherd of Pines Lutheran Church. Glad you're here to join and join this morning or today, and uh, thank you again for or for coming here and spending some time with, with us in the Word. If you have your Bibles, you can open up to the book of John. It's the fourth gospel in the New Testament. There's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and then John. John chapter 8, verses 1 through 11. Let's begin. We are here to listen to the word of our Creator, our Savior, and the one in whom we trust. We are here to worship the one true God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Grace, mercy, and peace are yours from God the Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Brothers and sisters in Christ, we are finishing up this four-part sermon series, Songs from the Heart, and we've been looking at some very um, well-known popular hymns and just um, looking at the words and, and understanding what motivated the authors of these hymns to, to write them. We heard about how great our God is, how awesome and wonderful and amazing um, our God is, and we we sing that praise to Him. We also heard of how precious our Lord is, and He takes our hand. We might be in a point in our lives where we need Jesus holding our hands, and He's always there holding our hands. And that's what we find comfort in: is that we might be in a very low point in our lives, we might be in a very good point in our lives, but either way, Jesus is there holding our hands. And you've, we've also heard of what a, an amazing friend we have in our Savior and being more devoted to our prayer life and how Jesus um, hears our prayer. He always listens to us. And that allows us to, to be confident um, in our prayer life. And today we're taking a look at our final hymn, Amazing Grace. Um, this a couple of trivia questions. What does Aretha Franklin, besides being besides being musicians, what does Aretha Franklin, um, Johnny Cash, Willie Nelson, and Elvis Presley have in common? What what do they have in common? All of them have sung Amazing Grace at one point in their careers. They all sang, took a took a um uh, uh, that, that hymn and, and and played it and sang it. Another trivia question: How many times do you think a year? Okay, we're only talking about a year. Has, it does "Amazing Grace" get sung? How many times do you think ballpark? Ten million times. That's how many times "Amazing Grace" is sung in one year. Another trivia question: Final one: How many albums? you think Amazing Grace has appeared on the song Amazing Grace? How many albums has that song appeared on? Over 11,000 albums. So you can see how popular this hymn is. And as you sing that song, you know, it, it, it's, again, this author is talking about an amazing grace. And a question for you is, is what is what is grace? If someone were to come up to you and ask you, what is grace? How would you respond to them? How would you answer to them? The definition of grace is God's undeserved love. Okay, it's, it's, it's a love that God gives to people <clears throat> who don't deserve it. And uh, the word for that. Love that's described in, in the Bible at times, talking about a one-sided love, is, is agape. That's one-sided. It, it's a love that's not given back to a person. So God loves us. And at times he does love us. He really knows that maybe at times he won't be loved back, but he still does it. And, and that's what grace is. It's God's undeserved love to sinners, to people like you and me. And the man who wrote this song, <clears throat> excuse me, experienced this amazing grace. Uh, his name was John Newton, and he was born in England, London, England, in 1725. And by the, I guess how you would, would 
measure a person's life, you know, if it was very fulfilling or if it was really challenging and and wasted. I guess you could say most of his life was wasted. He was uh, a man who loved the world. He um, drank heavily. He enlisted in the in the British Navy, and he afterward he found a job working um, in in the uh, shipping industry. And what I mean by that is that he um, worked as a slave trader. He worked on a boat that brought slaves from Africa to mainly to Europe. And that was his occupation. That was his job. And it, it was in one particular um, incident that, that happened to him. He, um, the boat that he was on was um, sinking. He got caught in a bad storm. And there he realized, you know, that, that he um, needed to come to know who Jesus was, who, his, who, who God was, because he prayed. And there was a miracle that happened. That boat ended up not, not sinking. But that motivated then this man to start to have a relationship with God. But it wasn't quick. You know, it was over a, a period of time where he finally um, became a, a, a mature Christian. And he um mote and then he wrote the song then, Amazing Grace. And he his his attitude toward God changed. He read his Bible um more and he looked at people differently. You know, if if you are a slave trader, you obviously don't value a, a, a race of a person. And that uh, they're just um, something for you to sell and make money for yourself. But that changed once he came to know his savior, once he um, you know, realized this amazing grace that God has toward people, his attitude toward um, people changed. And he worked tirelessly to stop the slave trading business. And, and, and so this was because of, of the, the grace that he experienced. You know, he realized that he had a savior who loved him no matter what he did, no matter what he was. Um, and and he just experienced this forgiveness of all of his sins by the life and death of Jesus. And, and, and friends, when, you know, in our sermon text, we're going to see a, a number of people experience the same amazing grace. But we'll also hear how we, you and I, have experienced this amazing grace, this love that God gives to people who don't deserve it. And so let's take a look at the sermon text today, John chapter 8. I'll, I'll read the first two verses. But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Early in the morning, he came back into the temple courts, and all the people kept coming to him. He sat down and taught them. Friends, Jesus, we see, um, came to Jerusalem um, from Galilee. And the, the, the time before this, when he was in Galilee, uh, they were about ready to, uh, it wasn't a very good visit because they wanted to kill Jesus. And so he was driven from Galilee, from Jerusalem before. <clears throat> and he spent some time in the northern part. He avoided uh, Judea, um, avoided the area of Jerusalem for a while. But he came down there because uh, his disciples went down. And they went to celebrate the festival of tabernacles. And this usually had happened in the, in the fall, um, September, October. And that's, that's the time frame. And so we are maybe about six months away from Jesus fulfilling the, the work of you know, the, saving people from their sins. He is so about six months away from that. And so it's, it's the fall time. He comes down to Jerusalem and he goes to the Mount of Olives and there is where he when he was down in Jerusalem that that's kind of where he stayed and um he would then it, it said that he early the next morning then he went back to Jerusalem went to the temple courts and and he interacted with people he taught people we see uh what his ministry looked like um he was on Mount of Olives he went down in the valley he came up into Jerusalem went into the temple courts, and there he was teaching people. Um, and, and, and we see 
which is just as all the people kept coming to him. So he was very busy that day. And, and he sat down and he taught them. He took this opportunity to teach them. And we just see it uh, again, a daily, uh, just a little part of our, our, our daily life of our savior. Um, and this is just a great opportunity to hear um, how our savior is using God's word and teaching people. And the people, they didn't realize it, but they were in for a very, very great lesson that day uh, because something uh, happens. What happens? Let's take a look at the next few verses, uh, verses three to six of John chapter eight. Then the scribes and Pharisees brought a woman caught in adultery and had her stand in the center. Teacher, they said to him, this woman was caught in the act of committing adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. So what do you say? They asked this to test him so that they might have evidence to accuse him. So as Jesus is there, and, and there's, I, I'm assuming there's a quite a bit of crowd. And this is a public area, open, you know, out, out in the open. And he is teaching, and, and we have two groups of religious leaders, Jewish religious leaders, come to Jesus. The scribes, it says, uh, these were the the experts of the, the the scriptures. They there there were experts in the Old Testament scriptures. That was their um, area. They they read God's word. They studied it, and so they were pretty familiar with a lot of the scripture, Old Testament scriptures. And so this group of men, along with the Pharisees, and the Pharisees were teachers. They were teachers in the synagogue, um, but they were also examples of of what people. At that time, you know, of what they, they thought a Jewish person was like. Uh, they were examples of, of the very strict um, living, living the laws of, of God's, God's word. And, and so you had these two groups of people come to Jesus, and it says they, were, they caught a woman who was committing adultery, and they brought her right in front of Jesus, had her stand in the open in front of Jesus, and and not only Jesus, but also to all the people that were there. So imagine that, you know, the there's a big festival happening in your town and, and everyone is at one location and, and imagine having imagine you being brought into the middle of that and your sin brought out in the open. Imagine going to a high school basketball game uh, on a reservation and Instead of watching a game, your sins are brought out. You are brought in the middle of the basketball court, and your sins are brought out uh, for everyone to hear about. Pretty embarrassing, isn't it? And that's what happened to this woman. These these Jewish leaders brought this woman who was committing adultery and had her sin broadcast to everyone, including Jesus. And these these leaders they really weren't interested in restoring this woman. This woman was was just bait for them because they were really trying to go after Jesus. They were trying to do something to Jesus. And, and what was that? It says uh, that they were they asked us to test Jesus. So they were trying to set a trap for Jesus. And let's see what happens. You know, when 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 they were set this trap, um you know, John tells us they were trying to find something to accuse Jesus of. And what was that? What were they trying to accuse Jesus of? Two things. Okay. The first thing deal happens, you know, happens to be the Romans. Who put Jesus to death? Do you remember who who carried out the death sentence? Um, the, the Jews cried, crucify him, crucify him, but who carried that out? The Romans did. And they were the only ones in Palestine in Israel who could carry out an execution okay and they executed Jesus so they they alone had the authority to put a person to death and what these Jewish leaders were trying to find what they were trying to accuse Jesus of um is is if Jesus said okay go ahead and and grab a rock and and do what Moses says go ahead and, and kill her he then would be accused of violating the Roman law because the Romans were the only one who could carry out an execution and order an execution. Okay. And so on one hand, they were trying to accuse him of 
of, of uh, going against the Romans and their laws. And the second thing that they were trying to um, accuse him of then is if he went against Moses, the Mosaic law, because in the law of Moses, yeah, they were um, partially right um, when saying that she needed to die. But if Jesus said, no, don't kill her, then they would accuse her, accuse Jesus then of going against the law of Moses, the, mo the law that God gave to Moses. And so you can see there was two things they were trying to accuse him of, going against the Romans and going against the Moses law. And these men, though, one thing to keep in mind is they didn't really care about the law. They didn't really care about the law that God gave to Moses. Why? Because if you look at the, the, the law that they were pointing to, Leviticus chapter 20, verse 10, look what it says. If a man commits adultery with another man's wife, with the wife of his neighbor, both the adulterer and the adulteress are to be put to death. So again, you can see they were just being really liberal with that the law, with the interpretation, because they only brought the woman. There was no talk of the man. And, and if they were really trying to follow the Moses, the law of Moses, then they would have brought both the man and the woman, just like it says in Leviticus, but it was only the woman. And only the Jewish courts, the leaders of these, uh, the, the Jewish um, society, uh, the Sanhedrin, only they had the authority to hand down a sentence of execution. And they weren't there at all. So these, these people, again, just, they were just trying to accuse Jesus of something. And the, the trap, though, was set. Okay, so you have the, that trap that it says. So what does Jesus do? Let's take a look at the end of verse 6. Jesus bent down and started writing on the ground with his finger. But when they kept on asking him for an answer, he stood up and said to them, Let the one among you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. Then he stooped down again and wrote on the ground. When they heard this, they went away one by one, beginning with the older men. So how did Jesus react to this trap? Because he bends down and he's writing on the ground, right? What is that? You know, we're not we're not told what he was writing, um, but why why did Jesus do that? Why? Did, what was Jesus' action saying when he didn't answer them? The way they wanted to he just went down and started writing well he was basically saying I, I know what you guys are doing right i know that you are trying to trap me i know that you're coming with this accusation and and you're not really caring about this woman you're only caring about finding something that you can accuse me of so jesus was basically saying i don't really have time for this right now i know you're trying to trap me i know that you are are, are coming you know with this uh, against me to find something against me um, but I know what you're doing. And, you know, these men, again, were, were just judging uh, pretty harshly, right? You look at, you look at what they were doing. Um, they were, there was no love there. They were uh, pretty harsh. I mean, bringing a woman out in the public like that and, and throwing her sins out for everyone to hear, and, and which, you know, is also hypocritical on their end. Okay, because um, remember Jesus, what he 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 does tell us, um, you know, he gives us authority in his word to judge people. But who do we judge first? What does Matthew seven say? Matthew says, "Do not judge, or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged, and with the measure you use, it will be measured to you." Those are words from Jesus. And he's saying, don't judge, or you too will be judged. Um, he's saying, judge yourself first. Okay, before you want to bring sins out of another person, look at yourself first. Because if you are, are using hate to judge a person, 
don't be surprised if that hate then is turned on you and you are judged in hate. If you are, are being unhonest, if you're not being honest, if you're being untruthful with your judging, that's going to be measured against you. People are going to judge you as being untruthful. And, and so you can see Jesus is saying, be careful how you judge. Judge yourself first. Look at yourself. Examine yourself. And if you find yourself then having dealt with your sin, be, you know, you're not being hypocritic, hypocritical, go ahead and bring that judgment then. Okay. Um, because he does tell us in Matthew 18, what we do if, per, if, if a person sins. What does Matthew 18 say? It says, if your brother or sister sins, go and point out their fault just between the two of you. So again, Jesus is saying a brother or sister, meaning a Christian, okay? Someone who, who sits with you in a pew, someone who is in your household who is a Christian, someone who goes to the same church with you, you have that same belief. Jesus is saying that person, if they sin against you, go by yourself and point out that person's sin. That doesn't mean that that we um, you know, go and start judging being hypocritical people who are not the same belief as us no it's someone who has the same belief brother sister and they sin against you judge them but when we do judge there's a something that we need and that's love we want to judge a person in love okay because we're not doing it to feel better about ourselves we're not doing it to um, tear another person down. No, that, that's, again, that's what Jesus is talking about in Matthew 7, judging in, 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 in an unjust way, okay? What he's saying in Matthew 18 is love motivates us because this person is headed down a path that is headed toward hell. And you have the opportunity in love to restore them, to lead them back to Jesus. And, and so you, you have a sin that they're struggling with. And, and you know about it. And so you in love, you go to them. And, and it might take a number of times, but you, you keep having that love there. That's your motivation to bring a person, to restore them. Um, and these men, though, were the opposite. They didn't have love. They had a hate. Um, and, and But one thing to keep in mind, friends, is... The grace that Jesus is showing to these men, okay? Because you look at his words. If one of you guys here is without sin, go ahead and throw a rock at her. He's, even though these men are wrong in what they were doing, Jesus is still showing love to them. And he wants to give them an opportunity to look at themselves and realize what they were doing. He wanted to teach them a lesson. And he wanted them to know about this grace when he tells them, okay, if one of you guys is without sin, if one of you guys is perfect, if one of you guys is holy, go ahead and throw a rock at her. And the men actually listen because it says one by one, starting with the older one, they all look at themselves, they judge themselves, and they realize, okay, what Jesus is saying here is right. Because I am... I might have a sin that nobody knows about, and I'm being hypocritical. And so you see the grace that Jesus extends to them, the love, this undeserved love, because they listen to Jesus, because all of them leave. And and so they, they drop their rocks, and, and they walk away. And he showed these men grace by reminding them to look at themselves and to realize they need a Savior. And friends, this is what Jesus offers to you and me as well. This is why we judge in love. Because of when we really look at ourselves, examine ourselves, examine our lives, look at our lives, and, and to have Jesus even know us, that's amazing. Because he's willing to, 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 to look through and, and forgive all of those. Look through those sins and forgive them. And, and to still love you. And 
just like he was doing for these men. Even though we fail, Jesus still loves us. And so what happens? Let's finish up. Jesus was left alone with the woman in the center. Jesus stood up and said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, Lord, she answered. Then Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go, and from now on, do not sin anymore. And so only Jesus and his woman are left. And we see this amazing love that Jesus has for this woman who was caught in adultery. It was just the two of them. And he wasn't there to condemn her as well. Instead, what did he do? Because of, of who he is, he forgave her. As true God, Jesus could see in, in her heart and, and see that she was penitent. She realized her sin. She was near death, right? I mean, these men were out for blood. They could have killed her. They wanted to kill her. But Jesus looked at her and, and realized that her sins, she, she was sorry for them. And in his, in, in his role as true God, he forgave her. And only God can forgive sins. And Jesus forgave her. She realized she was wrong. And, and friends, this is this is amazing grace because this we see God's undeserved love for this lady. And it's that same love that you and I have from God. This amazing grace. Because we see what he did to his son. As all of our failures, all of our sins, public sins, private sins. All of them, God took and he laid it on his son, on Calgary. He went and he put it on Jesus at Golgotha. And, and there he forgave our sins. He punished his son. His son took our place. And God put all of our sins on him and, and his son died for them. Forgiving us. And, and you, you think about that, friends. You, you look at your life. You might have sins of idolatry, idol worship, adultery, gambling, stealing, lying, gossiping, cheating. All of them wiped away by the blood of the Lamb. All paid for by Jesus. He's forgiven them, friends. And so now when God looks at you because your sins have been paid for and, and you trust that, you, you are, are now holy and perfect in his eyes. You are perfect like his son, Jesus, and no, no sins. That's what Jesus gives to you, friends. That's amazing grace. And that's what Paul wrote about in Romans 5, 8. He says, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we were still stuck in our sins, while we were still enemies of God, hostile, spiritually blind, unlovable, Christ died for us. That's, for, that's, that's love, friends. That's amazing grace. That's what John knew and experienced. He, he realized that his life and, and how unlovable he was by the things that he did and what he did, he all paid for by Jesus. And that's what this woman caught in sin experience. And that's what you and I experience. But Jesus also tells her, look what he finishes up. He says, go, and from now on, do not sin anymore. And friends, Jesus added this. Because <clears throat> there was, we don't know what, you know, what happened afterward? Maybe this, I, we're, we're hoping that this woman took Jesus' message to heart and never went back to committing adultery. I think that's how we know that story ended. But then you look at you and me. And sometimes we hear Jesus' words here, go and sin no more. And we don't listen to it, right? 
In fact, some of us are probably taking advantage of God's amazing grace, knowing that he's the God who forgives sins and thinking that we have a get away with sin card. For instance, drinking, right? We have a problem with drinking, drinking, getting drunk, and we know that's a sin, getting drunk. But yet we keep doing that. And here Jesus says, you're forgiven. Don't do it again. But we do it again. Or gambling, or stealing, or lying, or idolatry. Knowing that what the Bible says about idolatry and how God says, I want to be the only God in your life. We have a ceremony that honors people. But And we know what the Bible says, and yet we go and do that sin. Say, oh, I'll, I'll come back and I'll ask for forgiveness. See, we're taking advantage of that. And we're not really listening to what Jesus says. Go and sin no more. Don't do it again. You're forgiven. Right? Work on that. Don't do it again. But, but friends, we, we see again just how amazing this love is. Because we know that when we do sin, we do fail. We have a Savior who's forgiven it. He forgives. And he also helps us, though. That's what the song sings is God's word. That's how God helps you, friends. And that's what helps you and me to avoid sin, to crucify that sinful nature every day. Because that, that battle happens, right? And we see in Ephesians 6 how God supplies us says we have this armor, this armor that is given to us to help us. We have the word. And friends, that's why we have this song that's so amazing. That's why we have God's word that is so amazing. And that's why we have a church. We have people that can help us. Because we do need that help, friends. To remind us when we do sin, that there's repentance there to remind us that we are not alone, that we have others that can walk with us. And that's God's amazing love for us, friends. Jesus did save you. And he continues to lead you all to the promised land. We've been there 10,000 years. That's an amazing part of that song. There's a thousand years in God's life. Presence like a day and a day is like a thousand years. There is no time there. It's eternal. And there's peace and joy and Jesus there. And we get to spend eternity with him and experience over and over again this amazing love, this amazing grace. Amen. Now may the peace of God, which goes beyond all human understanding, guard your hearts and your mind through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen.